After its debut, Jimmy Neutron was a very popular show. At its peak, Rugrats definitely had it in terms of popularity, but by the time season one of Jimmy Neutron was airing, Rugrats was on its final season, leaving room for Jimmy to crack the top three most popular Nicktoons of the day. Do not ask me for raw numbers on this one. Maybe you can pull up data to show that actually some other show was pulling more views, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the nebulous idea of popularity. Which shows did everyone know and care about? Which characters is your mom likely to recognize? Your grandma? Who's getting a theme park mascot costume? Or say for example you were making a theme park ride celebrating all the Nicktoons. Who might be the central figure? Now number one on that list is, was, and has remained since its debut in 1999, SpongeBob SquarePants. But right between those two, keeping Jimmy from the top spot, was a show called Fairly Odd Parents. The show follows Timmy Turner, an average kid who no one understands. Due to his neglectful parents and torturous babysitter, he is deemed miserable enough to receive his own fairy godparents. This part of the show always kind of bugged me whenever it came up. There's no way some kid in suburban America is the most miserable kid on Earth. But you just kind of have to not think about that. Now I consider Fairly Odd Parents and Jimmy Neutron to be sister shows, and not just because they were running at the same time. Following the reign of the Rugrats in the 90s, SpongeBob felt like the beginning of a different generation of Nicktoons, and Fairly Odd Parents and Jimmy Neutron would be the next two successes that generation had. But on top of that, the plots for both shows were fairly similar. Jatimi would encounter some normal problem a child might have and attempt to circumvent it with their respective powers, Timmy's being magic and Jimmy's being science. Science. This would almost always blow up in their face, and in the end they'd have to stop the much bigger threat they accidentally created. Now Nickelodeon has had its fair share of sister shows, from Rugrats and Wild Thornberries to iCarly and Victorious. But Jimmy Neutron and Fairly Odd Parents differ from those two in two significant ways. For one thing, those were shows from largely the same creative team. Fairly Odd Parents and Jimmy Neutron certainly shared talent, but they were being made very differently, and in fact, both creative teams would make other shows that didn't really live up to the Jimmy Timmy power couple. Not counting Danny Phantom, that show was good. But more importantly to me, according to IMDb, which can be dodgy with their episode counts, so take this with a grain of salt, Jimmy Neutron ran for 59 episodes. Fairly Odd Parents ran for 159 episodes. Now, I would count this as an advantage to Jimmy Neutron. It's been drugged through the mud a lot less than its magical counterpart. But it's kind of like a comedy duo where one of them dies tragically young and the other one's career just sort of limps on for a decade and a half. You're not sure which is sadder. But I think it's worth analyzing why Fairly Odd Parents lasted so much longer. How come there's no live action movie where Josh Peck plays Jimmy Neutron? I mean, there's a reason you can probably figure out just looking at a single image of them. Yeah, Fairly Odd Parents was 2D, and that certainly gave it a staying power Jimmy Neutron was never going to have. Jimmy Neutron was one of the most successful computer animated shows of all time, and I only say one of because I'm positive there's a bunch of computer animated shows for toddlers I'm not familiar with that have it beat a hundred times over, but in the 8 to 12 demographic, I fail to think of any real competition. Except maybe like, The Clone Wars, but that's Star Wars, that shouldn't even count. And yet, it was still fairly short-lived, only making it about five years. Because Jimmy Neutron came out at a time where CG was still evolving. What was acceptable in 2002 was gonna look kinda dated by, say, 2009, something that wasn't true of Fairly Odd Parents 2D style. And that seemed to be the industry takeaway, too. While plenty of CG shows came out around the time of Jimmy Neutron, none of them achieved Jimmy's success and now just seem you know, kind of dated. So while film has boldly ventured forth into the realms of computer animation, with 2D animated films becoming rarer and rarer, TV has largely remained the domain of 2D animation. And may I say, until recently, rightfully so? I do think we've hit a point where CG can be done consistently without feeling dated. I mean, Spider-Verse will live forever as one of the greatest pieces of animation. But that's only been in the last few years, so it's fair that long-running shows continue to use the traditional style. On top of that, I think Fairly Odd Parents just has more mainstream appeal. Not to say it's the better show, we'll get to that in a second, but it's certainly the show I see normal audiences getting into more so than Jimmy. There's a level of weirdness people are more willing to accept from a 2D show 
than they are a 3D show. And I won't lie and tell you Jimmy wasn't weird. Jimmy Neutron was weird as fuck. Probably about as weird as his contemporaries, but the fact that it was in an unfamiliar style gave it less of a welcoming presence. Plus, 2D at the time allowed for a faster pace. Like this? Ah, enough! Get back! could not be a joke in Jimmy Neutron where the style is much slower and more plotting. That does make it more realistic, but it's a cartoon, I'm not really here for realism. I also think Fairly Odd Parents was more consistent than Jimmy Neutron. You can watch pretty much any episode of the early seasons and get a good idea of what the show was. Jimmy's visual style, I think, is one that's already going to be a turnoff to some people, and if you catch one of the awkward episodes, I think it's completely understandable to write the series off. I think you're wrong, it's a good show if you give it a chance, but I understand why people weren't flocking to it the way they were with Fairly Odd Parents. I'm, of course, speaking only about the seasons that aired concurrently with Jimmy Neutron. Once Poof is introduced, we're in a whole different territory. But I mean when the show was at its best. That being said, I think I'd be hard-pressed to say which is the better show. Each has some clear advantages. Like I said, Fairly Odd Parents can do much faster-paced stuff than Jimmy, and it was more consistent. Plus, the show had really good animation. It's a really good-looking show. But it also had a tendency to beat jokes into the ground. There are seriously jokes they repeat like a dozen times in the same episode. Plus, they have this bad habit of trailing off at the end of episodes, swapping a conclusion for repeating jokes again. And Timmy loses his fairies, or his fairies lose their magic in, like, every other episode. Jimmy, on the other hand, I think tended to do more varied stories. They could do action, sci-fi, horror, romance, and sometimes just good old-fashioned slice of life. And I just love the characters on Jimmy Neutron so much more. I think they work off each other well. Since no one else knew about Timmy's fairies, it really feels like everyone but Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda are side characters. It's not weird if Chester and AJ or Vicky or Crocker or even Timmy's parents are missing for entire episodes. That said, Jimmy relied a lot more on plot contrivance, and you know I've pointed out the show's many flaws. I think the easiest way to highlight each show's strengths over the other is to ask what episodes of these shows people remember. With Fairly Odd Parents, I think it's mostly the big specials. Channel Chasers, Abra Catastrophe, Schools Out the Musical, even the Christmas special. With Jimmy, though, I think the most memorable episodes tend to be the normal 22-minute segments. Nanobots Return, The In Men, McSpankies, Carl's Nightmares. Makes sense. Jimmy was at its best when it was about the characters, and the antics were so crazy that the special failed to stand out that much, where Fairly Odd Parents was at its best when they had to rein it in and tell a complete story. But then, if you start asking people what episodes they remember of these shows, they're likely to bring up a few specials for both of them. The Jimmy Timmy Power Hour. Z. A trilogy of TV movies where the two kids finally crossed paths. Of course, Nick wasn't a total stranger to crossovers, as Rugrats Go Wild had debuted a year before the Power Hours, but honestly, Disney Channel was smoking them in the crossover department, so I guess Nickelodeon wanted in on that sweet, sweet crossover content. Since after this, Nicktoons would become more of a brand, more than just TV bumpers, Nick cartoons would now consistently be seen alongside each other, and Jimmy and Timmy's powerful hours would be among the earliest and most iconic examples. I'm actually pretty sure it was the first Power Hour that got me to watch Fairly Odd Parents, as it was a show I hadn't taken much stock of previously. And hey, if there's one thing cartoon crossovers are meant for, it's getting kids watching other programs on the network, so this one certainly did its job. The special released in May of 2004, it actually would have been the episode before Minute Work, because my god, Jimmy Neutron Season 2 was fucking goaded. But hey, enough beating around the bush, here is the Jimmy Timmy Power hour. The special starts at Timmy's school with an upcoming science fair. Timmy is concerned both because he didn't do a science fair project and also because everyone at his school is a Jimmy-level genius. He was busy playing a game where you destroy the earth on a Game Boy, even though it has 3D graphics and runs on a disc, apparently. Cosmo and Wanda give him a poofer pin to poof him home, and he wishes to be in the greatest lab in the universe. Of course, he ends up in Jimmy's lab, which it's later made clear is in a different universe, but universe, multiverse, whatever. There, Jimmy is giving Goddard an update on his Jiffy Tuner. Because <laughs> it kind of sounds like their names. 
Gotta say, Timmy doesn't look great in 3D, but you know what? I'm okay with that. Seeing these characters in each other's styles was, like, the entire point. Even if it looks weird, it's just cool that it happened. Jimmy, of course, uses the poofer pin and ends up in Timmy's universe, and yeah, I really like how Jimmy looks in Fairly Odd Parents. And once they're in each other's universes, the episode is pretty balanced with it spending the rest of this 11-minute segment with Timmy in Jimmy's world, the next 11 with Jimmy, then back to Timmy, then back to Jimmy before the wrap-up. Carl and Sheen take advantage of Jimmy's absence by convincing Timmy to let them play with the dangerous experiments Jimmy won't let them play with. Mostly because they think he's Jimmy after some experiment has gone wrong, which is a fair assumption. It's cool seeing throwbacks to old episodes like this. That's the type of thing you want in a crossover, and it doesn't feel forced at all. And Timmy quickly gets the attention of Cindy by, uh, respecting her. You actually value my opinion? Sort of! Take notes, Jimmy Neutron. He also makes Judy think she's a superhero, and we learn a little too much about the Neutron sex life. Into your spandex leotards, lint boy! Your spandex? I get it! You wanna play one of those uh, special games, eh? But Timmy has replaced Goddard's tune-up disc with this world-destroying game, and now Goddard's a giant evil robot who goes around canceling people. Player one, your future is cancelled! Which is really cool, I'm surprised they never did Evil Goddard before now. He's even still voiced by Frank Welker. Meanwhile, Jimmy deals with the struggles of Timmy's world. He believes Cosmo and Wanda to be advanced holographic programs, something he clings to even after discovering Timmy isn't a genius. So I guess you're allowed to know about fairies as long as you don't believe in them? I remember the time when you wanted to avoid that math exam and you were Kent Quasar. Hi, I'm Johnny Quasar. It feels a little forced to have Vicky take him to school, but that's the only scene she gets in all three of these. Jimmy attempts to get the poofer pen to send him home, but it only goes to Timmy's room. But apparently all he needed to change its coordinates was a game buddy. Too bad Crocker shows up before he can use it and takes everyone to Fairy World. Back in Jimmy's world, Goddard is on a rampage of destruction, including the purple flurp factory that apparently Retroville has. Is this why the inhabitants refuse to drink anything but purple flurp? Timmy has to stop him by getting eaten and making his way to the emergency power shutoff. And Cindy convinces herself he set this whole thing up for her, because Cindy really wants a genius to like her. Meanwhile, Crocker knocks over the big wand and sets about taking over Fairy World, so Jimmy has to steal a bunch of science fair projects to fight him. Here's a line I remember quoting incessantly as a kid. Maybe I'll have a court jester. I hope he tells jokes and not riddles. Jokes have punchlines. You better have punchlines! Jimmy gets the big wand working again, and they're able to defeat Crocker, and everyone returns to their own universe in a pretty cool sequence. Of course, Timmy didn't do his science fair project, so as a favor, Jimmy sends Goddard over. They didn't bother animating him in 2D, they just cel-shaded the 3D model, but you know what? It still looks cool. Honestly, I think this is the gold standard for TV crossovers. It spends equal time in both worlds, features plenty of characters interacting with the other's supporting cast, has them both face threats that feel appropriate to a normal episode, and even takes the time to swap art styles. Granted, this is one of the few crossovers I can even think of where the art styles are so dramatically different that it would matter, but still, it's cool to see. It's exactly what any fan of either show, or even both shows, would want. And clearly they did want it, as this special was huge, and it must have drawn a lot of audiences to both shows. So, naturally, Nick made a second one. The Jimmy Timmy Power Hour 2, when nerds collide. I, I don't think that Timmy's really a nerd, more of a twerp, but I suppose he is at least pretending to be a nerd. Jimmy and Timmy have both decided to hold Friday the 13th dances. With Jimmy, it makes sense he's trying to disprove the idea of bad luck. Timmy, on the other hand, has no excuse. He even knows Friday the 13th is the day the anti-fairies escape fairy world. Luckily, Jorgen has made it so no one in this universe could break the anti-fairies out. I feel like the anti-fairies are pretty self-explanatory as villains, although you should know they thrive on bad luck. Jimmy intends to ask Cindy to his dance, but is distracted by Calamitous teaming up with... this random-ass villain who's only in this episode. Kinda looks like Dr. Moist, though. And Calamitous ditches him pretty quickly. Kinda funny, honestly. 
Meanwhile, Timmy realizes no one in his universe would date him, but he remembers that one chick that liked him, so he goes to Jimmy's universe to ask Cindy to his dance, thus forming a rivalry between him and Jimmy. And oh wow, Cosmo and Wanda look worse than Timmy. Make their mouths smaller, please. Also, Timmy's buck teeth work, but this whole row of chompers looks bad. While he and Jimmy are having a face-off, Calamitous sees his fairies and determines if he could get one of them to join him, he'd be able to destroy Jimmy once and for all. Neutron's lab. It's open. Well, maybe just a little peek. The most secure lab in the world. So it's off to Dimsdale to get Cindy back from Timmy. And yeah, it's cool to see all these characters in Fairly Odd Parent style. I'm totally black! And you, my dear. Uh, don't even go there. Sheen, I'd say, has had the roughest transition, while Carl looks perfect. That's just Carl. Timmy takes Cindy on a whirlwind of perfection, but all she wants to see is Timmy's lab. I wish? No! Not another word! I don't want anything to spoil this moment! So, absent of a wish, Timmy takes her to AJ's lab, where he just straight up steals a gene splicer, which looks a lot like one of Jimmy's inventions. Ah, oh, but I'm sure that won't be important. Oh, but not here! Someplace romantic! Someplace I'll always remember! Okay, I wish... Shush! And not another word until we get there! Okay, doing it twice is a little forced, especially because he just, like, takes her to the beach. Timmy keeps trying to ask Cindy to the dance in special places, but all the Jimmy characters keep interrupting. And eventually, to get them off his back, Timmy just gives the guys Cosmo and Wanda. So I guess if you're from a different universe, you're allowed to know about fairies. Meanwhile, Calamitous runs into a spot of bad luck after showing up in Timmy's world, attracting anti-Cosmo to his location. They agree to collaborate, and apparently when Jorgen said no one of this universe can get in, he meant being from this universe is the only thing keeping you out. And it's weird hearing obviously Butch Hartman jokes coming out of Jimmy. And now let's pause a moment as I perform the In Your Face dance. In your face, in your face, in your face. Uh -huh. They go to Crocker's lab and Jimmy makes a mega butterfly net. And then they have to generate as much bad luck as possible, which is also how they defeated the anti-fairies in the show. And when Jorgen and Calamitous go after the hypercube, Timmy splices them together. Calamitous has the more powerful mind, giving him amazing magical powers. But Jorgen, who actually translates to 3D better than anyone, can resist when he's angry. I need you to create the craziest, most illogical magic you can! Enough to make Jorgen furious! But where would we find someone as dangerously off-kilter as me? Dance, this joke lasts way less time than you'd want it to because it seems the only thing that really works is break into rules. Or at least make it seem like they broke the rules. I wish Jimmy Turner was gone! This was always weird to me. They're Timmy's fairies. He should make the wish. Also, use of gone instead of dead reeks of standards and practices. Then they just unsplice the two of them. They didn't really establish that Jorgen had to not be under Calamitous' control when that happened, but ah well. And for their help, Jorgen creates an interdimensional dance so Cindy can go with Jimmy and Timmy. And they trap Calamitous in a jar, and uh... Hi, Mrs. Neutron. No comment. And sorry, Jimmy, but we all know Betty Quinlan gets with Bowlby. In some ways, the second special is bigger and grander, bringing in major villains from both shows. But the villains don't really work together, and the anti-fairies, and thus the special's connection to Friday the 13th, disappear at the three-quarters mark. Also, having Jimmy and Timmy fight over Cindy seems weird on both fronts. Jimmy hadn't really made his feelings to Cindy clear before this, but the episode just kind of takes it as a given that Jimmy likes her. This was still before Vanishing Act. But on the other hand, obviously she's not going to end up with Timmy, right? She's not even from his universe, so this ending where they just sort of share feels weird. Unless they're planning an interdimensional polycule. But fuck it, it's the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour too. It's still pretty balanced, we get more of what was fun about the first one, and it just hits right in the nostalgia. 
So, uh, when my parents were in college, my dad's roommate started dating my mom's roommate. They eventually had kids about the same age as my brother and I. And occasionally, our parents would just take us to Chuck E. Cheese, let the four of us run around while they caught up. Uh, one particular trip to Chuck E. Cheese that I remember happened on the same day as the release of the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour 2. I think at the time I considered that the greatest day of my life. I I've certainly have better since then, but it does stick out in my mind as a particularly great moment from my childhood. Anyways, then they made a third one. In this one, Timmy's two friends are busy. Chester is moving furniture, and AJ is... freezing himself because he's sick of being the only genius. Where, if I'm right, mankind will be so far advanced, I'll be welcomed like a long-lost brother! AJ, how do you expect mankind to improve if geniuses like you just abandon it? So Timmy goes, hey, how about that one girl that liked me from another universe? So he goes to Jimmy's world to see Cindy. Why this has never happened before, who can say? Then again, there was only one Fairly Odd Parents episode released between these two. But Jimmy, who's been watching through his interdimensional viewfinder, isn't about to have competition for his girl and takes off to stop Timmy. They get in a jetpack race, even though I'm pretty sure Cindy lives directly across the street from Jimmy. Cindy's out of town, so Timmy asks Jimmy if he wants to hang out. Jimmy agrees, but they don't seem to have many similar interests. Until Eustace Scorch shows up and they realize they love fighting bad guys. They treat Eustace as the non-threat he is by defeating him quickly and kicking him while he's down. Then they go into one of Timmy's Crimson Chin comics to fight Nega Chin, something they also find too easy. So they decide to create their own villain to pose a real challenge. All the while, they're ignoring their real friends. We get to see Chester and AJ in 3D, which is neat, though we'll talk more 3D in a sec. They team up with Carl and Sheen, who've been annoying Libby all day, which just sounds like Carl is third wheeling to me. They try to get Cindy to split the two up, but they seem way more interested in each other. The villain, voiced hilariously by Jeff Garland, isn't very evil, so Jimmy and Timmy try to ditch him, making him angry and adapting to be able to defeat him. Or at least, force them to give him a name. Your name is... Uh, Shirley! Shirley! I like it! It's manly and threatening! Face the wrath of Shirley! Man, there's some jokes that land, but something feels off about the writing throughout this one. Ah! Awesome! Ah! Ah! Not awesome! Ah! Like, it's funny that Jimmy and Timmy think this is awesome, but why are Cosmo and Wanda chipping in? It's not even Butch Hartman jokes coming from the wrong characters, it's almost like someone trying to write Butch Hartman jokes while not fully getting them. Then again, this was definitely during a period of decline for Fairly Odd Parents writing, so maybe this is Butch Hartman humor. Plus, the tonal difference does kind of feel right for brain-drained Jimmy. That big truck is gonna eat the little trucks! Because, of course, the villain whose name isn't Shirley takes Jimmy's brains and Timmy's magic. Cosmo does make a jacket appear out of nowhere, although the show indicates he can change costumes even without magic. They trick VWNIS into going to Retroville, where he gets like a one minute scene and... That's the last we see of Retroville. Most of the rest of the special takes place in this white void of 3D models with 2D Fairly Odd Parents drawings. So, something my friends said about this special that never really bothered me as a kid is that... You don't really see Jimmy's world after the halfway point. I sort of took Shirley's world as, like, a compromise between the two. A place that is both 2D and 3D. Um, of course, that does mean you end up seeing a lot of Jimmy Neutron characters in the Fairly Odd Parents style, and not nearly as many Fairly Odd Parents characters in the Jimmy Neutron style. But, uh, it turns out there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, this was the last Jimmy Neutron thing ever produced by DNA Studios. They were in the process of closing while this was being made. So I assume they were given a lighter workload just to sort of compensate for that. The problem I have with this is that they found a way to get all the characters from both shows together and... None of them have any funny interactions. Like, Hugh and Timmy's dad meeting should be the easiest comedic slam dunk, and instead they just kinda... make silly noises at each other. Ooh, 
And Cosmo and Wanda are just hanging out with everyone else, including Chester and AJ. Maybe they think they're with Jimmy's friends. Jimmy and Timmy express sincere regret for hurting their friends, so their friends help them combat Shirley by making him adapt away his powers. And they put everything back to normal, with Shirley taking up a job at a pizzeria. Seems a little out of nowhere, but whatever. It's weird, there's no goodbyes, no real indication these two plan on separating. It even seems like they're setting up the worlds having even more crossover to come. Which, of course, they would not because Jimmy Neutron ended. Honestly, this one has a really good story, I just wish the comedy was there to meet it because it's easily the least funny of the three. But honestly? I like the story enough that I kind of want to consider this the canonical finale of both these shows. Jimmy Neutron had the three episodes that got dumped after this, but it was the last episode produced, and while you could argue League of Villains is a better conclusion, I like the implication of Jimmy and Timmy just interacting all the time now. And yes, Fairly Odd Parents went on for five more seasons after this, but you want to see something weird? In 2006, there were only three new episodes of Fairly Odd Parents. Two of them were Jimmy Timmy Power Hours, and sandwiched between them was the special Fairy Idol. Then in 2007, there were no new episodes of Fairly Odd Parents. And when the show finally came back in 2008, you know what it came back with? Meet the newest member of the Fairly Odd Family in a brand new movie, Fairly Odd Baby! Yeah! Now listen, Poof as a character didn't ruin the show, the writing was already going downhill. But his introduction is a clear line of demarcation in the series. Not everything before him is good, and he is not the problem with these later episodes. But every episode after he shows up is guaranteed to be one of the bad ones. So if you're in the stop watching when they introduce Poof crowd, congratulations! Your final episode of Fairly Odd Parents is the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour 3. Overall, the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour 1 and 2 are two of the best episodes of either show, shining examples of what a crossover should be and some of the most classic specials to air on Nickelodeon. And the third one is nice. I like it, it's just definitely the weakest of the bunch. Now I know what you're thinking. Am I gonna review Fairly Odd Parents? Probably not. I am prepared to make a Quentin review style bid for subscribers. I've sort of stagnated around the 5k mark, so if you guys can get me to 7.5k by the end of 2023, I will review all of Fairly Odd Parents. Now, I don't think you guys can do that. I don't think you're gonna reach this goal. I specifically set it very high, so I don't have to slog through this show. So just to really sweeten the deal, just to really encourage you to hit the subscribe button, if we don't reach that goal, I'm gonna review Back at the Barnyard instead. I might review it anyways. Oh look, we still got a little time left. Luckily this isn't the only time Jimmy and Timmy crossed over. Freaking What's up, babe? Frickin' spiny man, acting like he doesn't know me. But I'll show him. By dressing as the Fruit Stripe mascot? What? No, it's my new character, Stripey Norman. I'ma beat him at his own game. By having the better fursona. No, reviewing games! Matt, you don't really play a lot of video games. Nonsense, I just got done playing the Nicktoons Unite games. It's the biggest crossover event in Nickelodeon history. A series of four games bringing together the biggest names in Nick's house. And who would be in the first game but my boy Jimmy Neutron. And his boy Timmy Turner. And also Danny Phantom and Spongebob. I figured it was worth looking into for giving Jim such a big role, plus it seems like a lot of the fan stuff I find for Jimmy Neutron is for specifically Nicktoons Unite. I think there are plenty of people for whom this is their greatest or even only exposure to Jimmy Neutron. This game released in 2005, starring what were probably at the time Nick's biggest cartoons. Maybe we can look back now and say Avatar has stuck around longer, but I don't know, do you really want Aang in this game? These four shows felt tonally similar enough to work together. 
In the game, each character's main rival has teamed up for a multi-dimensional takedown of their heroes. Gotta say, this team-up feels a little lopsided. Vlad is actually a serious villain, Calamitous and Plankton are both silly cartoon villains, but they're still kind of a threat. Crocker's just a guy. I know, who else are you gonna do for Timmy? But still, Crocker is usually played as a joke villain. He's only really a threat when he has magic on his side. Jimmy gets the gang together to fight back, and we get three stages and a boss in Danny Phantom and Spongebob's world, two and a boss in Timmy's world, and one really long final stage for Jimmy before the end boss. Yeah, it's a little uneven. Now, from my perspective, this is basically a Jimmy Neutron game where Jimmy travels to the worlds of Danny Phantom, SpongeBob, and Fairly Odd Parents. I mean, he gets the hub world, the save points are Goddard, he's the character you play as the whole time. Or, or at least the one I played as the whole time. But yeah, obviously I'd appreciate a little more acknowledgement for Jimmy. I'd also appreciate if they hadn't redesigned him for some fucking reason. Jimmy's the only 3D character, yet he looks less like his show counterpart than the other three. Even the 2D images of him reflect this redesign. Except on the cover and load screen where they have Jimmy's original look. This is false advertising. Each character has their own unique abilities you'll have to use to beat the game, which I guess is cool if you're doing this multiplayer, but if you're alone, it can get kind of obnoxious. Also, it occasionally runs into that Attack of the Twonkies problem of let me try every different attack because I know it's one of them, but I can't tell which one. Danny and Spongebob start with melee attacks, while Timmy uses Cosmo as a ranged weapon and Jimmy has... a gun. Like, I think it's supposed to be a laser gun, but it makes a really gunshot sounding noise when you fire it, so... Yeah, Jimmy's got a gun, and you can upgrade them to new abilities as you go along. Danny can possess stunned enemies and go ghost to walk through walls or jump further. SpongeBob can throw doodle bobs, make bubble bombs, and absorb water- Oh my god! That's both hilarious and horrifying. It's... horrifying. Timmy can freeze things and become cleft, boy chin wonder. And Jimmy can shoot flares, use every video game's favorite of his inventions, the shrink ray, and put on a football helmet and run into stuff? Uh, did you guys watch even one single episode of Jimmy Neutron? It'd make a lot more sense, I think, to have Spongebob do the headbutting than give Jimmy either the bomb power or make the Doodle Bobs robots or something, I don't know. The first world is that of Danny Phantom. These levels are... fine. The only thing I didn't like all that much was these electric coils you have to freeze then destroy, but they're in a lot of levels, so it's not even a complaint exclusive to this world. But I do have to make a bit of a confession. I watched Danny Phantom as a kid, but I never kept up with it the way I did these other three shows. So when these goblin and ghost villains showed up, I assumed they were Danny Phantom villains. And then they showed up in all the other levels. These are just the villains of this game. Really, the only villains until the final level. And that's a big complaint I have. You couldn't even give each world unique villains. They don't even have to fight different, just slap a different skin on them. This game is so repetitive. I got really sick of walking into the room, the doors close, and you have to just kill all these guys before they open again. This game borders on being a beat-em-up, and honestly, they'd be better off if they committed to that a little better. Also, weirdly, they have some fully voiced cutscenes, but they also have a lot of parts that are left to text boxes, seemingly to cover up for how few voice actors they got. Other than the four leads and their four villains, I'm pretty sure the only characters with voice actors are Cosmo, Wanda, Patrick, Sandy, and Cindy. And I'm pretty sure Cindy's only in there because it's the same actress as Sandy. Actually, I didn't notice this till editing, but Crocker doesn't even have a voice? How? How do you not get the voice of one of your main villains? Jack Fenton is present, but doesn't have a voice, which proves conclusively these consoles couldn't handle Rob Paulson's voice. This feels really half-assed, honestly. A massively cut corner that's just impossible to ignore. 
The boss fight with Vlad is a little tedious, but like the other Danny Phantom levels, I found this one inoffensive. The SpongeBob levels, however, I got issues with. The first one's fine, but the second and third are way, way too long. First, you got Jellyfish Fields, where you gotta fight this jellyfish catcher by first shrinking it, then getting in as many hits as you can before it regenerates. Rinse and repeat until it's dead. It's a really obnoxious mini-boss to have to fight. So of course, they stuck it in the level like eight more times. And don't think you can just walk past it like some enemies, because they turn into water puddles for some reason, and Spongebob needs to absorb those to progress. And after you fight your way through what feels like more than a complete level, the Flying Dutchman asks you to find all his ghostly crewmates. Just a random thing tacked on at the end. Then you visit the Jellyfish Factory, which in the show was definitely something Mr. Krabs built, but now it's part of Plankton's operation. You've got a decent escort mission with Patrick. I am okay with this. This would have sufficed for a level, but it just keeps going. Plankton is a decent boss, I did have to look up how to beat him, but only because I forgot Spongebob could make bombs. For once, I was dumb, not the game. Then we get to Fairly Odd Parents, starting in a castle Crocker has made for himself. I kinda like this level, it's fun to destroy these Crocker statues. Definitely goes on longer than it needs to, though. And you remember that Find the Flying Dutchman's Crewmates segment that felt tacked onto Spongebob's level? Yeah, that mission is the entirety of the second Fairly Odd parents level, it is comically short. You're really gonna give this show one fewer levels and then make one of those two levels a fraction of the Spongebob level? And then we get fucking Crocker, who's just an awful boss. You gotta throw bombs at him as Spongebob until his health is depleted enough for you to do the obnoxious freeze and destroy electric coils thing as Timmy. But okay, I did it four times, let's move on. Oh, what the fuck? There's phases to this boss? Once would have been bad. Three times put you in the running for worst level. Upon returning to Jimmy's world, they bump into Cindy. Why does she have her movie design? Why is goddamn Jimmy Negatron the only game that can get this right? Jimmy finds the League of Villains is hiding inside Goddard, so they have to shrink down and travel inside him. The only Jimmy Neutron level is Goddard. Not a location from the show, just the inside of Goddard. And he has a smaller Goddard inside of him? They do at least finally introduce new enemies in the form of these robot fleas that you also get sick of by the end of the level. There's also a giant flea level boss. The level bosses in this game are so annoying. You attack them for a while, they hop away, and you gotta defeat a horde of enemies before they come back. Now do that about a dozen more times. And finally, the great end boss where you have to... Press these buttons to move bridges, and it's pretty unclear which button moves what. And also, you can't move the camera, so sometimes the bridge is off screen and you gotta run over just to look and see if you got it. You know, I complained about no camera movement pretty early in my Jimmy for console review because it was a pervasive issue with the game. Here the camera movement hasn't been a problem till now, but ooh does it make this extremely tedious boss fight even more tedious. Because while you're doing that, the villains shoot you and spam all the same boring enemies from the game. I really hate this end boss. I'm honestly not sure if this or Crocker is worse. And so the day is saved, but Jimmy gives everyone a device to help them come together again if they need to. Yeah, I'm sure they'll invite you next time, Jimmy. This is a very unremarkable beat em up collectathon. Repetitive, uninspired, and easily the best game I've played for this series so far. It doesn't live up to Jet Fusion's best moments, but it doesn't come close to its worst either. I was annoyed at this game, but never angry. This is a perfectly acceptable Jimmy Neutron licensed game. Except it's not a Jimmy Neutron game, is it? It's Nicktoons Unite! The glorious uniting of all Nick's biggest stars. And that fact drags it down. You can half-ass a game about one of these properties, but all four is just unacceptable. Why have so many corners been cut? I don't even blame the developers for that. I blame Nickelodeon. Give this game the budget it deserves. 
Maybe I could forgive the underwhelming gameplay if the writing was there to make up for it, but they skimp on the character interaction so much, and most of what we get is just there to move the story along. So much missed potential. We do get a handful of good references to the shows. They include Plankton's Lab, Jimmy mentions his Neutronic air gun from Jet Fusion, and they even reference the Power Hours. Even though they also contradict the Power Hours by having Wanda say they can only grant wishes in Timmy's universe. Yeah, I think I've said it all, an epic setup wasted on an underwhelming game. Then in 2006 we got the sequel, Nicktoon's Battle for Volcano Island, which doesn't feature Jimmy Neutron as a playable character, so I'm not playing it. Quite infuriatingly, this game introduces a bunch of new playable characters, and they are all from Spongebob and Danny Phantom, while Jimmy is relegated to a phoned-in cameo. Now, the Spongebob favoritism I get. It is undoubtedly Nick's biggest success, and he's basically the face of the company, the way Mickey is for Disney or Bugs for Warner Brothers. Hell, these games were called Spongebob and Friends in a lot of foreign markets. But I'm certain Fairly Odd Parents was more popular than Danny Phantom, and honestly, I want to say Jimmy Neutron was too. That one's arguable, maybe I'm only saying that because I was into Jimmy Neutron, but I swear, I hear more more about it than Danny Phantom. And hell, maybe it's a regional thing. Maybe Jimmy Neutron was only bigger here in the States. From what I've heard, it didn't make it to a lot of other countries. So maybe by the time this came out, Danny Phantom was more popular worldwide? I don't know, if you lived outside the US in the 2000s, let me know which was more popular where you were. And if you lived in the US and think Danny Phantom was more popular, please elaborate. I think Jimmy Neutron was more popular. Oh, hey, I forgot you were here. You're a lot less talkative than Spiny. I just like hearing you talk. Aw. Anyways. Moving on, in 2007 we got Nicktoon's Attack of the Toybots for Wii and PS2, with Jimmy reinstated even though this was after his show ended. Although actually it was after Danny Phantom ended too, and Fairly Odd Parents was on hiatus, so Spongebob was the only one releasing new episodes at the time of this game's release. So to keep it up to date, they added the most classic, unforgettable Nickelodeon character ever, Tack from Tack and the Power of Juju. Now, Tack actually started as a video game series in 2003, but in 2007 he got his own show on Nickelodeon. It didn't last long. Like, Back at the Barnyard has more episodes. Yeah, with the original four, it felt like Nick's biggest shows of the era, but Tack can't help but feel like them going, Hey, check out the new Tack and the Power of Juju show, only on Nickelodeon! But I mean, what other show did they have from that era that lived to be timeless? Oh yeah, that one. That, that you should have gone with that one. To the game's credit, there are a number of playable characters from classic Nick shows to choose from, which is something that has felt lacking from the series thus far. Don't expect to see them in any cutscenes or to affect the story in any way. That's reserved for two shows that had been cancelled and one you only kinda half remember. But to the game's credit, you can play as Rocco, Stimpy, Ginny, and Gurr, though apparently Handheld got El Tigre too. Also, rude of them to deadname Ginny in the opening. The characters also get alternate costumes that you can buy with these lament configurations you pick up. I don't know what these things are supposed to be, but bet your ass I'm grinding to get Timmy's cowboy costume. None of the characters really play any different, although that does cut down on switching back and forth between characters in the middle of levels. The one place they kinda play slightly different is in these bonus stages to unlock master models, this game's version of the nav chips from Jet Fusion. You need them to progress. Though, unlike Jet Fusion, they don't make you backtrack through the whole level. They'll drop you right in the area you need to be in and even tell you which characters you need before you start. SpongeBob's areas bring back his tongue surfing from Battle for Bikini Bottom, so it feels nice. Danny's is this awful ghost section that just drops you in with no instructions and expects you to figure it out. Tax is this wall jumping section that's technically distinct from regular gameplay, but not by much. And everyone else, it's just more of the same platforming from the rest of the game. Tack, Danny, and Spongebob are the only ones with any unique gimmick, and even Tack's is tenuous. 
I actually ended up in one of these areas without even realizing it was something different the first time. The master models themselves are based on Nicktoons characters, and it's another great way this game celebrates Nickelodeon history. They got some deep cuts. Otis from Barnyard, Otto from Rocket Power, Tuesday from The X's? This may be the first time I've thought about The X's since before this game came out. You can view them in The Basement, and if you press A, a single frame of smoke will appear. Why is this a feature? Why, why is it just one frame? I will say, for as hard as Jimmy Neutron gets sidelined in the second game, they make Professor Calamitous the main enemy of this game. He is apparently on some sort of interdimensional villain game show where he unveils a plan to force feed Krabby Patties to fairies so they'll create magic farts that somehow give off ghost energy? It's a real stretch to fit Danny into this plot. Although it's a real stretch to fit any of them in this plot, as all he's making are evil toys. Come on, Jimmy did that by mistake. These couldn't just be robots? He's also trapping famous Nick heroes to create evil toys of them, so it's up to Spongebob to free Patrick, Tack, Jimmy, and Timmy before they finally meet Calamitous' right-hand man, Chadbot. Yeah, okay, you guys definitely didn't watch any Jimmy Neutron. Chadbot, who kinda hates Calamitous, offers to let them call Danny Phantom on his interdimensional phone if they bring him more Nickelodeon toys. But, uh, they already had interdimensional communicators. Why would they need his? And I'm sorry, people complained that the levels in Nicktoons Unite were too long? Have you played Attack of the Toybots? These Toy Factory levels never end. While the first game is repetitive in a broader sense, this one is repetitive on the granular level. The stages pretty much all look the same. You've got three never-ending Toy Factory levels, plus the Bikini Bottom and Fairyland levels end up looking really similar, all filled with endless platforming challenges. The two levels that are different are these mech suit stages that still manage to feel painfully repetitive by the end, but we'll get to those. Some of these platforming challenges are so easy you can breeze through them in a few seconds. A few are challenges that take some effort or patience, sometimes more patience than I really have. But a couple of these, ooh boy buckle up cause you're gonna be here a while. This is the most deliberately challenging game I've played. Jimmy for console was hard because the controls were poop. I don't know how they did it, but they programmed a whole game using only human feces. This game is designed to be hard. Honestly, it's too difficult for a children's game. Some of these I might get in a more advanced game. If these showed up in Cuphead or Super Meat Boy, well, they'd probably be the lamest part of the game, but I'd be more okay with the difficulty. I don't know how any 10-year-old was supposed to beat some of these. This game doesn't have a life system, and I think it's entirely because it would be impossible if it did. So yeah, you get infinite lives, although they can be pretty uncharitable with their checkpoints. And a lot of these don't feel fair or rewarding. It was just another thing I had to get past. The timing is off with some of these moving platforms. It's too easy to overshoot your jumps. The controls in this game are pretty good. They're very tight and precise. Surely you knew where jumps would end. And a few of these I have to call out specifically. You guys can eat my ass. Jumping over a single one of these panels kind of sucks, but the opposite direction panels were unbearable. Especially because in this 2D platforming challenge, you have to worry about a third dimension. You shouldn't be able to fall off the back. That's the type of place you put an invisible wall so I don't execute the timing perfectly and then still miss. That happened more than once. One place they do have invisible walls is this stair portion, but there's just a little too much space between the stairs and the invisible walls, so it's really easy to miss a step to the right or left and fall back down. These are some tall stairs, cut me a little slack. There's rotating butterflies that kind of remind me of Carl's butterfly in the Jimmy Neutron movie, and most of them are okay, I can't say any of them were good though, but this one I still have no idea what the correct timing is. Every time I made it, it felt like pure luck. 
Also, you gotta grab the butterflies, but grab and spin dash are mapped to the same button, so sometimes your character just decides to roll to their death instead of grab. See, Spiny, Jimmy can spin dash, you're not special. There's these guys you have to hop over while attacking rocks, and at some point they're coming so fast, it's jump, attack, jump, attack, jump, attack. And you better get the rhythm right, or you'll ground pound and you won't have time to recover. And I hope you didn't want to unlock Gurr, because the special stage to get him is nigh on impossible. You gotta hit these trampolines, but you can't go on the first bounce or you won't make it. You have to bounce, reposition yourself closer to the lasers, and then jump over it. But you better get the reposition on the first bounce or the UFO chasing you is gonna kill you. Even if you execute flawlessly the first time, this thing is coming right at you. There is no room for error. But, uh, maybe it's fair to make it more challenging to unlock more beloved care. When you collect fairies in increments of 100, Jorgen stops the game dead, interrupts whatever you were doing to tell you how many fairies you've rescued. Richters, what the fuck? I should also talk about how awkward the trampolines are. In most games, you hit jump as you hit the trampoline to get a bigger jump, but here the jump has to happen at the top of your arc. Timing your jump with the trampoline perfectly and being rewarded with an extra high jump is so much more satisfying. This is just a triple jump where you don't get to control when the first jump happens. Also, the fairy world level needs to be talked about in isolation. You see things like these and you remember all those times you grabbed rotating platforms. So you press the button and no, why did you think that would work here? It's also very unclear what you can and cannot touch. The game has a very specific way it wants you to complete this. There's these floating portions that come out of nowhere with no instructions. The game will repeat how you do a move every time you need to do that move, and then it'll just throw you in somewhere and expect you to figure it out. It's amazing to have a game that holds your hand too much and not enough. So there's a part of the level I thought was genuinely impossible because the game didn't explain there was a button I could press to go down. So let's talk about the two mech stages. They require you to point the Wii remote at the screen to aim. I don't think motion controls are bad. There's plenty of games like Wii Sports that implement it well. It just got shoved into way too many games where it didn't belong back in the Wii era. Amity Park is bad, but not uniquely so. The only odd thing is at the end you fight a tank with Jimmy's design on it. You can't put the hero's design on the thing you gotta fight. But the final stage in Calamitous' Lair, which again fails to adapt any actual location from Jimmy Neutron, ends with this bit with infinitely respawning sponge bots, guns that are out of reach and can't be shot, and you have to shoot down two of these red things to shoot the shield generators to beat the level. It's exactly as obnoxious to play as it is to hear described, and that alone I think grants it the worst level award. And then Chadbot wins the biggest evil genius because he collected all the master models and he defeats calamitous and that's just it it's such a weird out of nowhere nothing conclusion it's like they knew they couldn't possibly get worse nicktoons unite at least ended on a lame joke despite how long i played the game it felt lacking in content three levels take up 70 percent of the game then there's just four other much smaller levels. There's not even a final boss. Not that I'm really upset there isn't more of this. This game makes big improvements on Nicktoons Unite with tighter controls, a bigger roster, more varied enemies, and more fully realized cutscenes. But it's just a pain in the ass to play. Too easy in places, way too hard in others, and rarely does it land in the middle. For as much as it does right, it fails at one of the biggest things a video game needs to do. It's not 
fun. It's kind of hard to stack up to the other games. I'd definitely rank it below Twonkies and Jet Fusion. At least those had some actually fun parts. And honestly, I'm ranking it below Jimmy for PC too. This game is polished, but it's no fun. That game was occasionally fun in spite of how horribly unpolished it was. And that leaves one final game, the last time Jimmy would grace our consoles. And weirdly, they changed the Nicktoons title to focus on just one show. Uh, Jimmy Neutron featuring the Nicktoons Globs of Doom, I believe it was called. Released in 2008, the game would be the first in the series to completely exclude the Fairly Odd Parents. Damn, at least the second game gave Jimmy a cameo. It also really doesn't make sense because three of the five shows represented had already ended, and one of the two that was still on was fucking Tack and the Power of Juju. Why would you keep him and not small headed Jimmy? My only guess is so he can't just wish the bad guy away, but the other games dealt with that fine. Filling in for Timmy is Zim and Dib from Invader Zim because this was after Nick realized people really liked that show. In the game, globs of goo from outer space are raining down on the worlds of our heroes. What the goo does is inconsistent. Sometimes it mutates or mind controls you, sometimes it traps you, sometimes it just slows you down, and sometimes it comes to life to fight you. So all Nick's greatest heroes, minus Timmy, team up with their villains to fight back. And the villains are just like already on board with this, there's no convincing, they're ready to go. I kinda don't know why the villains are even here, honestly. They don't even bring back Vlad and Calamitous, instead it's beautiful, gorgeous, and uh... Technus? Y'all, I watched Danny Phantom as a kid and I have no idea who this is. And I was never going to recognize this tack villain. Beautiful Gorgeous kinda makes sense if you can't get Tim Curry back to be Calamitous, but I also think Ublar or Evil Jimmy might have been more recognizable. Hell, Evil Jimmy I think is self-explanatory enough no one would have questioned it. Or, you know, just pay Tim Curry and have Calamitous in the game. Although after sitting out most of the GameCube era, we can finally process Rob Paulson's voice, and he plays two of the villains. So maybe they didn't want him on a third, thus Evil Jimmy's exclusion? And if they just wanted more female characters, I think they could have done better than Beautiful Gorgeous. But I don't know, Beautiful Gorgeous is odd but not unthinkable. Thank fuck it wasn't Eustace. Plankton is the only one of these villains I see anyone getting excited for. Well, and Dib, but the joke there is Zim is kind of the villain of his own show. You could have easily still had both of them and then just got interesting second characters for every other show. Jimmy can have Carl or Sheen or hell, even Cindy. Sam and Tucker have been in other games, so it makes sense to bring one of them back. You could have Tack and second character from Tack and the Power of Juju, and I'm sure Nick would have loved an excuse to shove more Spongebob characters in here. I mean, Patrick probably has more screen time in these cutscenes than Plankton, and he's not even playable. This feels like an improvement on the original Nicktoons Unite, by which I mean it feels like Nicktoons Unite but without the cut corners. That game was a half-assed, boring, repetitive beat-em-up. This is a polished, boring, repetitive beat-em-up. All the cutscenes are fully voiced and animated, we get levels set in all the show's worlds, and an equal number! Two stages and a boss fight for every show. Well, okay, Tack doesn't have a boss, because that's when you fight the final boss. And like, if you had to disrespect one of these shows, yeah, it should be Tack. Plus, you're rescuing characters from these shows. It feels far more fully realized than the first game. The one thing I think is noticeably worse is that you don't get to pick which character you play as, which makes no sense. I'd get it if they all had special abilities that the level was built around, but they all play more or less the same. There's not even a narrative reason for the team-ups we get. It genuinely feels completely random which character the game allows you to play as. Heroes never play with their own villain, and often you'll go through entire levels as no one from that show, including in boss fights. 
There's not even a free play mode where you can replay as whatever character you want. You are stuck as the characters they pick, no matter what. Which feels like a huge step backwards. That was one of the last game's best features. And varied playstyles is something I can give Nicktoons Unite. It got obnoxious in parts, but it's one place where that game tried and this one didn't. The one difference in playstyle is your special move. Though all of them just stun your enemies for a one-hit kill, except Danny's, which creates a ghost clone to fight for you. Beautiful Gorgeous's hypnotizes people. I know, can you even believe it? Let's also address how the characters look. The more high def he is, the less I like redesigned Jimmy. And this game goes overboard on these cutscenes. They're higher definition than they've ever been, but they're way too shiny. They look plastic. I thought the last game was about toys. I guess another thing Nicktoons Unite gets better is story. I know that's weird to say because who cares about the story in a Nicktoons game? I sure don't, so why am I listening to Spongebob Squarepants talk about an ancient evil from the beginning of time? I saw evil, and his name is Globulus Maximus, older than time itself. This is way too much for a Nickelodeon game. Tone it down. Anyways, the first three worlds are pretty repetitive, so I'm gonna skip straight to the bosses. I will say it's recognizably places from the shows, generally. Some of Zim's levels get kinda generic lava world, and a lot of Danny's is just hopping across rooftops, but it's better than fucking Attack of the Toy Bots with never-ending factory levels. So the bosses. Spongebob gets bubble bass, and let me tell ya, this boss fight is so easy I beat it before I even figured out what I was supposed to be doing. I started mashing C where it told me to start mashing C, then I got distracted answering a bunch of questions in chat, and before I knew what C even did, I'd beaten the boss? I know you can burn the patties, but is that good or bad? Who cares, let's move on. At Zim's house you gotta fight Gurr, and when you get him at about two-thirds health and then again at the one-third mark, he throws you out and you have to make your way back in. Which is kinda lame, I get they want him to have phases, but in that case, make him go deeper into the house. Have him crawl through a hallway you gotta fight through, then phase two in the kitchen before he retreats to Zim's lair, which you also gotta fight your way into. Throwing me right back outside is, like this franchise, dull and repetitive. Danny's boss is this ghost dog. You gotta make him run into the buttons, press the buttons, and trick him into chasing you through the lasers. It's tediously boring, but it's also pretty easy, and they only make you do it twice. I wish a lot of bosses in this series had that much restraint. The gimmick sucks, but at least it's over fast. And then we get to Retroville, the first time Jimmy Neutron's world was adapted into one of these games. Not just the inside of his dog or his villain's hideout that's conspicuously just another factory level. It's Retroville. They start us off with a Retroland level, and I mean, there are two games with cooler Retroland levels because they actually let you explore Retroland. But hey, it's better than Jimmy for console. I wait, that's not actually a compliment, is it? I meant to say at least they adapted a recognizable place for the Nicktoons game. Yeah, it's from the movie, but it's the most memorable part of the movie. The weird thing is we see Jimmy's girl-eating plant, huge and mutated, attacking Cindy in Retroland. But then you don't rescue Cindy until level 2 and you don't see the girl-eating plant again till the final boss that is not in Retroland? What happened here? Level 2 takes us to Jimmy's neighborhood, leading to his lab where we board a ship that just takes us to the candy bar in a pretty awkward transition. It feels forced. If you want to have the candy bar in there, that's where the level should start as you fight your way through the neighborhood and into Jimmy's lab for some specific part or something. It's kind of easy to get lost in these levels. It didn't happen too much, but at least twice I was unclear where I was supposed to be going and had to spend a minute wandering around looking. You got some hover car portions on rails? You 
still haven't watched Jimmy Neutron, have you? You gotta jump lasers and my immediate reaction was, oh boy, back to Attack of the Toy Bots. And I was having a pretty hard time until I realized all I had to do was jump straight up and I'd clear it. It was so easy, I thought it was harder and I overcompensated. I guess here I'll talk about these mini bosses. You gotta hit them in the legs to bring them down, then hit the center a bunch, and it's kind of a weird, not very fun mini boss. So of course, they slap it in the game a dozen more times to the point of tedium. These enemies are made of slime. You can make them look like anything. Why is it the same three designs the whole game? This is lazy game design. Cindy has been redesigned in the same way Jimmy has, but Carl and Sheen remain unaltered. I kind of hate Cindy's redesign too, but hey, at least it's show outfit Cindy. Congrats on being as good as Jimmy Neutron versus Jimmy Negatron. Then the third level is the Retroville Mall? I guess there was a mall in the movie. I'd let it slide if it didn't pull this teleporting girl eating plant thing and also the gimmick of this boss fight is you have to get into dress stores so the plant will eat you. I kind of assumed the plant would work off I don't know, hormones or brain waves or something but apparently it's just are you in a dress? You know there's already a girl on the team, right? I suppose it spitting you out twice is cooler than being thrown out of Zim's house, especially since you've gotta go a different path each time, all of them visible from the start. That's a much better approach. This may be the most competent boss fight. Hard to say, you do still just wail on the uvula whenever the game just lets you. And yeah, it's lame that the boss fight is at some unidentified mall, but a uh, 2 out of 3 or whatever. I actually might like Tax World the best. It felt like Retroville tried a few new things that improved the game, but this one goes deeper with some minor, not too difficult puzzles. Something to switch the gameplay up, but it's not boring and tedious. I think if this were World 2 or 3 and they kept building on the game like this, it could have been a good game. It could also have been boring and tedious, but it's already that, so it'd be a lateral move. I suppose it also benefits from not including the final boss because counting that, this world really sucks. Globulus Maximus sends out these clouds and you gotta fight these bodyguards that have lasers coming out of their sides and shoot heat seeking globs at you constantly. So there's nowhere to really stand, or float as it were, to punch it without taking damage constantly. So you basically just Hit it as much as you can before you die, respawn, and do it again. If there's a better strategy, I never found it. Wait, you're supposed to stay far away from him and weave while shooting? No one told me I could shoot! And he naturally does this three more times. I hate it so much. Worst level by miles. And just to tie up the story being absolutely bonkers, Globulus reveals he's... God's booger from when he sneezed everything into existence. But now he's decided he wants to be just like SpongeBob and turns himself into Sponge Glob. Jimmy is the only one who has a problem with this. Then the villains decide they want to use Globulus for nefarious purposes and you gotta fight them as Sponge Glob. This fight is a fucking joke. There's no strategy, you just wail on them till the health bar goes all the way down. That's the final level. It's like they forgot to do anything with the villains and then just slapped this on at the end. And that's Nicktoon's Globs of Doom. It's boring, too easy, the story makes no sense, and it goes back on features present in previous games. And it's also the best game Jimmy Neutron is in, at least for console. Overall, the Nicktoons Unite games never quite lived up to their real potential. The series is just so generic, with games often playing things too safe and not exploring the possibilities these games present. But at least two of them are functional and inoffensive. That's more than I can say about any of Jimmy's standalone games. 
I suppose here I'll discuss Jimmy's appearances in other Nicktoons games. Of course he's in all the handheld Nicktoons games, even some handheld exclusives. I remember having Nicktoons Freeze Frame Frenzy as a kid, but we'll discuss the Boy Genius's handheld outing some other time. Nickelodeon Toon Twister was a computer game where you could make 3D animations with Nicktoons characters and would be the only Nicktoons game to feature Libby, though Sheen is absent. He was playable in the party game Nicktoons Party Blast, which weirdly doesn't feature any Fairly Odd Parents characters. He's appeared in the most recent Nicktoons racing game, Nicktoons Kart Racer 3, along with Cindy. Weirdly, there's no Fairly Odd Parents characters in this either. Sheen and Ultra Lord were playable in Nicktoons MLB, though Jimmy's only available in the DS version. Again, no Fairly Odd Parents characters. And of course, most recently, Hugh was in the first round of DLC characters for Nicktoons All-Stars Brawl. A game that also features no Fairly Odd Parents characters. What gives? At this point, I'm starting to think someone involved with Fairly Odd Parents is withholding the characters. Surely Nick would want one of their longest running shows to be represented in these games. I am impressed with the breadth of references in Hugh's moveset. Look at this, Flippy's in the game before Jimmy. He's got the light sword, his duck plane from Fundamonium, he even bounces on a banana, which I think is a reference to that one line that's kind of a meme. Oh, and his victory pose is Donut Boy. I am disappointed they have once again not adapted any location from the show for his stage, though maybe this is supposed to be based on the Puel song from the Christmas episode? Oof. Is that it? H have I covered every possible facet of Jimmy Neutron? Not the handheld games. I I need time for that. Anything else? No, that was very thorough. Cool. Now I've only got one thing left to do. <laughs> Fucking coattail riders. Dum dum dum